Good morning and welcome to Amsterdam for the fourth annual Money 2020 Europe show. Now, magic is always in the air at Money 2020, and we are so proud to provide the melting pot in which such extraordinary experiments can take place. Cards and phones are taking over payments. On the back of tech contactless payments, mobile phone payments, and mobile POS terminals, non-cash transactions are growing at the fastest pace ever. When we had the idea of starting a bank, there had only been one bank established in the UK in the last 150 years, and it's a new bank. If we, if we really believe this platform can work, if we believe the opportunity in the market, we have to prove it ourselves before we can actually expect other banks and other markets to actually adopt and understand where the opportunity is. And therefore, actually for us, it was, a, it, it was almost an essential part. But there are three ways in which we innovate within ING in order to make sure that we do deliver on a differentiating experience to our customers. The first one is that we have our own innovation from within. We do that through boot camps, and we have our own ING labs in different places, where we have super talent really taking those ideas from within and trying to develop those. And sometimes they become separate companies like Yol, like Cobase. There's another way in which we uh, innovate, which is we have a 300 million venture fund to invest in some of the initiatives that you may even have companies that have either specific technology or business model that really is close to our strategy. So we're not investing just for the financial upside, that's not what we believe in, but we're investing in companies that do something that is very much aligned with what we try to accomplish strategically. So we're not just a venture capital fund, that's not what we do. And the third area clearly is cooperating with some of you, making sure that we deal and that we share our, our experiences, and that we connect to each other in order to ensure that we do deliver on that differentiating experience. Well, when you're dealing with the, the toughest issues around the world, you never have sufficient information. You could always benefit from more. And you don't have that first-hand knowledge when you're sitting in Washington, for example, of you know, what the people on the ground in Syria are experiencing. Yeah. You, you, you may have it filtered through journalists or filtered through embassy reporting or intelligence. And so the challenge is to, to be able to recognize that you're never gonna have perfect information. You wanna get the best possible accumulation of knowledge that you can. But you have to get comfortable making decisions with less than perfect information. That's, that's, that's awesome because that's one of the things that, you know, when I was working for Big Coast and then decided to start Feeds, I was a part because of that, is there are sometimes the people that know the most, they're not in the room. They are the senior people that are there, but the people that actually know, the people that actually know the technical aspect or the, or the detailed aspect, they're not there. And they need to be heard. To me, it's fairly obvious that China and US are gonna be more isolated in how, how they prioritize tech investments and what, what, is, what is allowed to, to flourish. Um, on the other hand, I think if you look at Europe, but actually more uh, explicitly Southeast Asia and South Asia, there the situation is completely different, right? There's massive amounts of Chinese investment in India and in Indonesia, in um, the Philippines, and there is a lot of American capital there as well. So I think those places will be a huge destination for, for global capital, and it's probably where you're gonna see a lot of innovation on, on the back of that. So as a company, I feel rel relatively excited about, um, about Southeast Asia, South Asia, and actually also Western Europe, where I think you can get the best of all worlds, and I think models are gonna be more local. So I think in terms of innovation and progress, I think Southeast Asia, South Asia, Europe are, are in for a good ride. It is the largest chip in the world with 23 billion transistors. Not in mi that square? Not, not million, yes. Billion? Billion. Uh, and it has uh, 7,000 logical processors. And uh, the, the unusual thing about uh, this chip uh, is that it gives a much higher performance than the GPUs, the, the NVIDIA um, uh, graphical processing unit. And it is only the third time in the history of computing 
that we've needed a new type of processor architecture. We're very driven by customer needs. So through our conversations with our cl key clients and also um, what they perceive as you know, the, the top three, I guess, difficult things to do cross-border, payments could be one of them, but and there's also cash management, and there's also um, you know, working capitals and all sorts of other needs. And a lot of times, these internet companies look for a very holistic or a very you know, end-to-end solution. Because going public means you are open to the quarterly treadmill of having earn showing earnings and meeting EPS forecasts and so on. I think uh, uh, Jeff Bezos kind of has nailed it in terms of finding a public shareholder base that completely aligns with his uh, uh, vision for the long term. And, and I think that should be the model that one should probably follow because it's very successful and well tried where you set the expectations from day one. But I think if you're a consumer centric business like Uber is, there's material advantages to going public because it creates branding, you get, you, know, you get free advertising without actually having to pay for it. Uh, and then secondly, I think if you're in businesses of trust, such as financial services and so on, where you rely on maybe debt capital over time, I think that can also be an enabler for a company to grow significantly by actually going public as opposed to staying private. <laughs>